All right, we might get started. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Kim Pepper, um, co-founder and technical director of Previous Next. We're a Drupal shop that's based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I'm Boris Gordon. I work for Previous Next. I'm a senior developer there in Sydney. Um, so just to make sure everyone's in the right room, um, this is a session for developers. Um, we're not going to be looking at any Drupal 8 site building or any of the user interface changes. Um, we don't actually even show any screenshots from um, the u user interface of Drupal 8. Um, and while we're going to try and give you a, an overview of all of the changes that are in Drupal 8, uh, we won't be able to cover, cover everything because there is quite a lot of, of things going on. Um, should add that there was um, uh, an emerging pattern that emerged putting this session together. We kind of found that there was um, uh, a theme, I guess, which is basically if you learn one of these, uh, if you learn uh, one of the concepts in Drupal 8, you can really apply it everywhere, um, even including things outside of, of Drupal. So let's get started. All right. So um, there are some major architectural changes going on in Drupal 8. Um, there's a big move to object-oriented PHP. Um, the minimum version requirement for Drupal 8 is PHP 5.4. Um, with that, there's uh, PSR 4 was brought in. Um, we brought in a whole bunch of external libraries, so we're using Symfony and others. Um, and there's major changes to the, the routing, the entity APIs. We've got configuration in there. Um, we've got plugins and even changes to the front end with things like Twig. Um, but you don't need to be afraid. So what we're going to do um, is basically try to explain some of these changes from the perspective of Drupal 7 site development. So if you're a Drupal site developer wondering what the changes are going to, how they're going to impact you, then this is the session for you. Um, uh, so just a quick question out of the audience. Who has actually installed Drupal 8 already? Wow, okay, so about half of you. Um, and have you looked at any of the, the kind of uh, coding or module changes in that? Yeah, a few of you, okay. Um, has anyone in here actually come from working with another framework like Symfony or Zen framework? Okay, great. All right. <clears throat> so, um, so basically the message is that if you, um, Drupal 8 is basically going to teach you to be a better developer and participate in the wider PHP community. Um, we're essentially shedding a lot of the Drupalisms that we have in Drupal 7, and we're embracing more of a, uh, a standard way of, of working with PHP. And um, improve interoperability with other projects as well, so that's something you'll see later. Um, and I think Dries mentioned in his keynote, we're, we're almost standard, standardising on things like um, Symfony. Um, and essentially, learning Drupal 8 is going to make you a better developer, generally. So first of all, um, we've embraced Composer, so we're low, we're, we're, and the, the idea that we're pulling in external libraries. So there's a bunch of them listed up here. That's just a sample of them. Um, but the real change is this this change in the whole PHP community. There's a PHP renaissance. I don't know if you've heard that term thrown around before. Um, but it's essentially the first time that Drupal's actually truly leveraged using external and open source pro projects. So in, I think in Drupal 7, there was only jQuery. Uh, I think we might have had one other library that was kind of modified um, to be used in Drupal. Um, Simple test was brought in, but we pretty much forked it and, and used it um, for our own purposes. And now we're using at least 11 or 12 external projects, multiple libraries from those, those projects, um, from Symfony components alone, uh, 13 or 14 components. And similarly, we're using a lot of JavaScript um, libraries now as well. So. Um, we're using, we've embraced modern PHP, so essentially we've um, we're using, oh, my original slide said PSR 0, but we're actually PSR 4 now, um, which was only in last week, which is a, 
uh, a namespacing convention for autoloading um, PHP classes. And th this is um, part of that uh, interoperability uh, thing. So one of the motivations behind that is uh, we can easily pull in these external libraries and, and just use them. So that's, that's part of the motivation behind, behind that standard. So um, for those, those of you who haven't seen object-oriented code before, it's pretty basic. Essentially what we've got is we need to, um, we need to follow the PSR4 standard. So I'll just point up here. So essentially we're putting our file under a, a source directory and we name our class, uh, our file the same as our class name. Um, we give it a namespace, which is basically just making sure we're isolating it from our other code. Um, and we can actually um, tell PHP that we're using other classes. Um, we just define a class with this class keyword um, and we can extend or implement interfaces. And essentially just our code is wrapped inside, inside these classes. So, so in uh, Drupal 7 modules, you might remember we have to essentially prepend uh, the module name to each of our, our functions and, and this is sort of ach achieving a similar Similar goal, keeping it encapsulated. We don't. Uh, we can use whatever name we want, and it doesn't. Not going to collide with uh, with other modules. Okay. So um, dependency injection might have been something that's new to you. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of what that is. It's something that's a very common pattern in Drupal. It is. It's an object-oriented design pattern, essentially. Um, and essentially, what it does is it achieves inversion of control or swappability of, of the dependencies that we have inside our classes. Um, it's basically a fancy way of saying don't call out to some code, um, uh, some re reusable code library, but have isolated call components calling, um, so, like calling framework co code internally. And this basically provides better modularity. And um, the way it's implemented in uh, Drupal 8 is uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to understand. It's just uh, explicitly declaring the code that you're going to call out to uh, in, in a constructor. So, and we'll see an, an example of that. Yeah, so this is essentially what dependency injection is. All we're doing is we've got a class, um, and you can see in the constructor, we're just passing in the, the database connection. Um, so when that class gets created, it passes that, that database connection in. Uh, we save it to a... Uh, protected property of the class. Now we're using the th this keyword to signify that it's this class. And then when we're actually caught doing a database query, we, we use that database connection from the class itself, so the property on the class. So ra rather than, um, when we're going to use that database uh, code, rather than calling out to some, some global external thing, we always go through uh, the dependency that's been injected to us. And so, and that's, that's really all there is to it. Um, and uh, this gives us uh, the ability to use things like test doubles uh, to test our, test our class in isolation because we can provide different versions of that dependency. And essentially what we're doing, we're, we're loosely coupling our code. So um, it means that it's easy to swap out um, different implementations, if we, especially if we're using things like interfaces. Okay, so a dependency injection container um, is essentially something that just wires all these, of these um, classes together for you and instantiates them. So um, we're using the, the Symfony 2 dependency injection container in Drupal 8. Um, and what that means is that um, essentially that takes care of creating all of our objects for us. So we're not having to call you know, new my class. Um, that, that you just assume that everything's there and all plugged in for you. Yeah, so this is to sort of address like some of the overhead of, of decoupling these components into little pieces. Um, it makes the, the act of cr creating them and injecting the dependencies a little bit laborious, so we've got, uh, we've got a way to deal with that. Um, we can wire it together with some configuration, and we'll, we'll see an example of that, I think. Yeah, so in the, the steps to take are basically, first of all, you just write your class um, using the standard, the PSR4 standard. Um, and then you just need to create a, uh, a services YAML file in your module root. So you name it with the name of your module um, and then declare the service in that. So this would be an example um, of the services um, container. Essentially, we're just specifying um, a unique name for the service. So it's, uh, it's, it's uniquely identified. Uh, we specify the class and then 
any arguments that we're passing in. So in our example, the only argument that we're taking in is the actual database connection. And that database connection is just a reference to another service definition that might live, say, in Drupal Core's services YAML file. Um, so what's um, exciting about Drupal 8, I think, is, is that we've got a whole bunch of new ways to extend it. So if you are used to Drupal 7, um, the way that you would extend code in Drupal 7 was essentially just to write a module. That achieved, that's the way that you did most things. Um, but it's pretty exciting in Drupal 8. We've now got uh, a number of different ways. We've got much more granular ways to, um, to extend Drupal functionality. And one of them is services. So you could see we could easily swap out what database we're using with something else. So we could replace a MySQL um, database service with a, maybe a MongoDB one. So um, we've got a lot, a lot um, more loosely coupled software, so we can actually swap out some of these services. Um, another way is plugins, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, so now we're going to just look at some, some practical um, examples of code in Drupal 8. So we're going to walk through some of the things that you would commonly do when writing code for Drupal 7. Um, and the first one is basically routing pages and forms. Um, so the first step is just to actually look at what does hook menu in Drupal 7 actually do. Um, essentially it does quite a lot. Um, you, um, they all tend to get um, combined together. Um, but essentially we're handling routes, so that means that we're, you know, when a request comes in at a particular URL, you know, call some, some code. Um, and return the output of that. Um, but we're also doing things like creating default menu items in there. Um, we're also uh, doing things like creating local actions, um, and lo so local actions are the sort of sub-tabs sub that you see in the page, and local, local tasks, which are like the, um, the link at the top, which might be like plus add content or something like that. They're, they're local tasks. So that was all handled in hook menu. So this is one of the more uh, like immediately visible changes, um, splitting those those two concerns apart. Um, um, so I think we'll look at uh, routing first. Yep. All right. So this would be your classic example in Drupal seven. Uh, and you've got a hook menu there. Um, you're returning an array because Drupal loves arrays. Um, and you know, essentially just defining a page callback there. That's the name of the function that we would call. And then our function um, would just return a string. All right, pretty simple example, but useful just to demonstrate what the difference is in Drupal 8. Um, so creating a new um, page callback in, in, in Drupal 8, um, we're not using hook menu. We're essentially first creating a, a standard PHP class and then creating a route definition in a new file, which is essentially in your module directory. Um, and again, we prefix it with the module name, and it's just routing.yaml. So... Um, this is our controller class. Um, essentially, here um, it's a it's a pretty standard class. The main thing to note is that um, we're extending controller base. So this is a, a built-in helper class for creating um, contro uh, route controllers. And then all we need is a simple public function that's just going to return our our content. And you can see. Um, I'm just returning a render array. So it's a standard render array like we saw in Drupal 7. Nothing too complicated. Um, and then the route definition. Um, so we actually, every route in Drupal 8 has a unique key. So this is the top, the top part. Um, we don't, um, we're no longer identifying all our routes in the system by path. We're using the, the key that we've defined in the YAML file. Um, and then we've got some um, other configuration here. We specify uh, under defaults that we've got a content um, callback that lives, and we can actually specify that just the part, the uh, class name and the function name that, that's going to get called when that route gets called. Uh, we can also add some requirements, and um, a simple one is just to add a permission requirement that you need to have certain permission to access that route. So by uh, splitting out uh, or decoupling the, the route uh, ID from the path, um, we can do things like actually change the path 
that keep all links that have been generated using that route ID, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and then also uh, we can respond uh, to the same the same URL with say different uh, different request headers, so different contexts, so uh, or even different uh, HTTP methods, so get or post or accepting um, uh, taking uh, responding with JSON versus HTML, all all in the same path. So, yeah. so you can you can lock it down and say okay, well only I'll only take get requests on this. So so if someone tries to send a post, it'll just reject it. So. Essentially, this is the, the core reason why um, the core reason why Symphony was added in the, the Symphony routing system um, was basically to support the web services initiative, so that we could actually serve um, off the same routes. We could actually serve um, JSON or XML content without actually having to to um, to, to have different URLs. Um, so um, there is. Um, a lot provided by that controller base class. So you might know that you, your old friends in Drupal 7 were all of the, the procedural um, global functions. So they're all listed on the left. So we've essentially, because we want to be OO in Drupal 8, we've got object oriented equivalents of those. So um, essentially, the T function is replaced by a function that's available from the base class called T. Um, but all of the things that you would normally expect are there. And you notice that instead of doing things like creating URLs by using a path. We're always using the route name now um, internally. So that's one key key change. Um, and we've got access to some, some new things like uh, the, the config and that kind of thing. Um, so basically, we've got, we've got mappings between the old and the new available for us. Um, yeah, and, and, and I guess the, one of the main reasons around um, making sure that we're actually using these um, these functions in, from the base class is that our, our code is now unit testable. We're not calling out to any kind of global procedural functions inside our code, which means that we can test that code in isolation of the rest of the system. Yes? So, uh, going back to the comparison to menu, if my module, my custom module has three paths, and if we're on PSR4, that means I'm going to create three separate files, each one with a single class, but one each one. Uh, no, you can you can create multiple. You can create one controller class and then have multiple functions on that. So you'll have one class and one YAML file. Um, and you map the map to the method in that class in the YAML file. So we might, we might just. It's the method in the class, not the class. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. I might just say, people, uh, this session's getting recorded through the mic. So if you've got questions, we might leave it to the end and we'll. Um, Speak through the mic, and that way we can get your questions on. Cool. All right. Um, so there is there is a, a, a pattern that we're going to be using. So how do we actually depend, inject dependencies into our controller? So we looked at dependency injection before. Um, we had that services YAML file in the in the root of the module, um, but that's going to be um, a lot. If you've got a lot of controller routes, that's going to actually be a lot of of, of um, services that you need to contain. Um, so the way to get around this in, in Drupal 8 was uh, what's called factory pattern. So instead of um, the container, um, sorry, the dependency injection container creating all our controllers, um, we just um, have this sort of self-creation mechanism. So there's a, a, a public static function called create um, that has the container in it, and that gets called externally. And then essentially all it does is call like a new on itself. That's what that, that uh, return new static means. So we still get the benefit of using dependency injection. We can, um, we can still inject any of our dependencies that we need, like database connection or whatever um, else it might be. Um, and this is just a simple pattern that you need to know um, in order to, to have your controllers do that. All right, that's it for controllers. Um, so forms are very similar. So if you're familiar with Drupal 7, um, you might be familiar with Drupal get form, um, which you'd normally call from, I don't know, your, your, um, you put it into hook menu and have a call your, your um, form function from that. Um, it's actually a lot cleaner in, in Drupal 8 now. Um, we, we've got a, a class that you create where all of the form functions are self-contained. and um, essentially, all we need to do is hook up a, a route definition in the same file that we're using for our controller, 
um, and just specify that it's a form. Yeah, so it's a, a, a more like self-documenting approach actually, and we can use things like uh, IDE or other tools to to give us an idea of where we're uh, not not overriding a method, or there's a method to override, as opposed to having to read through the API pages or or, or comments. So it's um it's more consistent and uh, and a better better developer experience. Yeah, so this is an example of a form um, in Drupal 8. So. You might notice the first thing up the top is that we're extending, again, from a, a, a base class, a form base. This is a helper class that you would use in all of your forms. Um, form base actually implements an interface called form interface that says that anything that, that, um, that uh, implements this interface must have these methods on it. So the first one is get form ID. So that's a unique name for your form. Um, in Drupal 7, this was the name of your form builder function. So it's not a magical kind of mechanism anymore. Uh, we can explicitly define what the, the unique idea of our form is. Um, and then we've got the standard kind of functions that you would expect. They're not magical names in terms of putting, you know, like um, underscore submit or underscore validate on it. We've got one there for building the form. Um, I should say that the, the form API hasn't really changed much in Drupal 8. It's still um, the same bunch of arrays. You still do exactly the same thing. Except now it's inside, you're building that inside a, um, an object oriented class, not a PHP object. Um, and, and we've got methods there for submitting the form. Um, there's also a validate form, which is optional, that you can implement, which is also part of the, the form base. Okay. Um, and then to hook that up into our route, so we want to have that, that form be um, visible through a URL. Um, it's so very similar to our controller example in the beginning. The main thing you might notice, which I'll just point, is that we've actually got a, um, a, a different key. So the other one said control uh, content. This one actually says form. And that just note, makes sure that it goes through the usual form building functions when we're calling that route. Um, but pretty much identical to the other, the other example. OK, so. One of the big changes is that hook menu is actually completely removed now. So um, no, no hook menu in, in, in Drupal 8. Um, so what was, what's left over? We've still got a few things that weren't actually, um, that were all in, in hook menu. Well, thankfully, they've all been split out. So they're all, in, they're all managed independently or separately now. Um, so yeah, we've got default menu links, local tasks, and local actions. So let's have a look at those. So they've all been uh, moved to YAML files. Um, so this is uh, consistent again. Um, and you can see there. Uh, <laughs> can you see? I can't see. Yeah. So essentially, like all YAML files, we've got a, a unique key for our, our menu link. Um, and you might notice that we're actually specifying the routes that we're actually using in there by their unique key as well. So we're not using the paths again. We've got a, a way to identify that. Um, and again, if so that just means that we've got one more level of abstraction around the, the actual URL. So if we change it once, it'll get changed throughout the system. Um, and you can see you can, you've got um, keys in there for weight to be able to move things around and those sorts of things. So these create default, default uh, um, menu items. menus. Menu links. Yep. Local actions are the same. That's like the, you know, the plus add new content kind of thing. Um, again, unique keys there, and we're actually specifying uh, the root name and also um, what root they actually appear on. So that's the page that you want to see them on. Um, and similarly, local tasks. They're the tabs that you see on the page. So you can see a consistent pattern there around how we're using routing. <laughs> so, um, so basically, this is um, the ability of these routes. We can actually we mentioned this earlier. So you can you can actually have the same route respond to um, or return different results based off some some things like the accept header or the method that you're actually trying to get. Um, there's some doc there's some documentation there if you want to go and have a look, um, and we'll provide links at the, in the slides. Um, 
All right. So next up's the configuration system. Um, and this is going to effectively replace uh, the variables table plus uh, uh, features or more accurately C, C tools, exportables. Um, it's uh, kind of inspired by that, but it's all been brought together into a consistent API and um, is going to open up uh, easier deployability and, um, and just, uh, just consistency in general. So um, let's have a look at that. So in Drupal 7, we had pretty much just one, one way to configure things, uh, which was the variables table, plus uh, uh, we could access that through settings PHP as well um, for overrides, but it was a pretty simple system, and you had to kind of, you know, put serialized arrays into it, and it was a bit ugly, and... Um, and yeah. uh, it was getting used for a lot of different things. Yeah. A lot of things are kind of being munged into one, one thing, and that's actually been cleaned up a lot in Drupal 8, so we've separated some of those things into, into different APIs. Um, so first up is kind of like the simple um, con config stuff, so um, that might be what you would normally use if you're writing a custom module, you, want to, uh, you may want to save your settings, um, then you can use Drupal config. So the top example is your, I guess if you're, if you're in um, procedural code, but you can actually dependency in uh, use dependency injection if it's in the controller to pass in a config factory um, so you don't actually have to call that that slash Drupal um, config function at the top um, and yeah essentially you've just got some pretty basic um, functions that are getting called on that so get and set on that so that's for your your classic kind of basic setting stuff um, so the way the way it works is that you, there's other sessions on, I should mention on, on some of this stuff that you might have seen. There's videos available. We won't go into too deep dive on the, on, on the config system here. Um, but essentially you've got a, uh, an active store, which is where all of your current um, config lives and a, a, a living system. And the concept is that you've got a staging store as well. So um, if you are working locally and you're developing some changes, you can export that config, push it up to... Uh, you know, production server and load that config into your, your active store. So that, that is ex imported and exported using YAML. Um, and we've got things like a, a, the tool, we've got the UI in, in Drupal 8 to be able to do that and tools like a diff to be able to see, okay, what has actually changed. So that, that's changed a couple of times. It is in the database at the moment, um, but that actually doesn't matter. Uh, it, was, it was in files, the active store, but it's... Um, it's uh, definitely in the database, but it's still the same process. There's a, an export and import system. So. And, and because it's all um, loosely coupled with services, um, there'll be a lot of people who might want to swap out the config active store with something like Redis or some other kind of key value store that they can use in a production environment that's going to be more performant than a, than a database. Okay, so... Um, what you typically do if you're building a module, you might use your module settings form. Um, that's not um, there anymore in Drupal 8. Um, instead, you would create your form class, but instead of just extending form base, you can extend a class called config form base, and that gives you a few helper functions. Um, so this is just a simple example where you would, um, essentially what you need to do is um, build your form, um, and then just before you return, just call parent build form. And what that does, like the system settings form function in Drupal 7, just adds things like a submit, um, a submit button to the form um, and uh, the, what theme to use. It's just a few basic things. And then when you're saving, when you submit your form, again, you'd save your config before you return and then you'd call um, parent submit form and what that would do is basically do things like, you know, show you a message that says, you know, your, form, your settings have been changed. Um, it's not doing a hell of a lot, but it's just going to be take out some of that, that stuff that you do every time. Um, I should note that in Drupal 7, system settings form actually just copied all your form values and saved them as variables to the, to the variables table. That isn't the case currently in Drupal 8. You kind of have to do this, the config stuff yourself. Um, yeah, so this is basically calling the parent build stuff. All right, complex config. 
All right. So this is where uh, configuration uh, entities come in. So these are things like uh, views, rules, um, all the stuff that we, we would store in, in custom tables and then uh, use things like CTOOLs exportables to, to, to help us deploy them. Uh, we have a, a core API now to, to handle that. Um, and it's um, consistent. Uh, we don't need per module workarounds. Everyone can use the same system. And, um, and it has, has two interesting features. One is that we can treat them like entities um, uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with them. And then, of course, uh, we can export them just like the, uh, the simple config and deploy them. Yeah, and I should say that this is um, all shared all across core. So we're using the same API for everything. Um, um, so things like fields, node types, block types, image styles, views, filter formats. Um, all of that is using the same API. They're all um, config entities. Um, and we've actually got a unified entity API. So um, content, we've got a concept of content entities, um, which would be your nodes and those kinds of things, um, and config entities. And we've essentially got a unified API around, around that. So um, the same, um, the same functions calling on those objects. So it's going to actually be a huge developer experience improvement because there's going to be consistency there around how things um, work. And um, if you learn it once, you can apply that everywhere. Um, again, configuration docs are available. I suggest you go have a look. They're getting fleshed out at the moment. So, um, I should also add that um, the workflows for how you actually do deployments aren't really um, prescribed in Drupal 8. Essentially, that, I think, will evolve once people start building sites and finding new ways to do deployments. Um, there has been some discussion about how this would work, um, such as you know, committing your staging um, config to a repo and then, um, then doing a git push and then pulling it on the server. Um, but core, core doesn't really tell you what to do. It's just essentially providing the API and I think all of those stuff, all of those tools will evolve in contrib in the coming years. There's some, there's some videos online of, of uh, people doing different versions of it, or uh, if you want to check out the Drush uh, 7 presentation by most Schweitzman from this conference um, uh, to see how it might be done with, uh, with Drush. Um, also, the, the config has actually got um, translate support or multilingual support. So I'm um, using um, schemas to define what all the keys in our config are so that we can actually provide translations for all of those so you can actually have multiple versions of config. Um, so as I mentioned before, instead of just using the variables table for everything, we've tried to split out some of the, um, the core concepts. So if, you, if, you're, if you're using um, the variables table just to store some temporary state, so an example might be, you know, a menu rebuild is needed. Um, there's a new API for that. It's just called state. So you can, uh, you can just set that and, and, and um, it's, it's meant for simple cases. Um, and there's, there's also um, a settings API. So that's essentially um, just calling a direct wrapper around the settings.php file. So if you ever previously were just using variable get and assuming that the settings.php file was overriding what was in your config, now you can actually just access that directly with the settings API. And the conf array is still there, so. Yeah. Okay, so plugins. Um, Um, so I think you should always, you can basically inject any, anything that I've got here where I'm calling static, like static functions like Drupal, consider those that they, sh they can be dependency injected. There's still procedural code in Drupal 8, so anything that's in the .module file is not PSR4, essentially. But if you're creating a controller or a form, then that is object-oriented and you should be dependency injecting all of this stuff. So the the answer, I guess, is that there's two ways of doing it, <laughs> and you should choose one way in the use, use the right context for it. 
Okay, so plugins. Um, there was a great session yesterday on plugins. Um, if you're interested in, we won't go into in too much depth now, but just to give people who didn't see that just an idea about what plugins are all about. Um, essentially, we're not using hook info anymore for a whole bunch of things. So previously, you know, um, we would be, um, you know, defining, uh, you know, or providing some default settings for things using hook infos. Um, it's all declarative stuff. Um, and that those are pretty much all being replaced by plugins. So um, any any time we wanted to have our module be extensible by other modules, our main core way to do it was uh, things like registration hooks. So hook, yeah, hook something info, and and that's what we're really uh, re replacing with the plugin system. If you've ever used C tools plugins, it's uh, a, a modernized uh, version of that, uh, but but definitely inspired by that. Yeah. So um, yeah. So basically, if, you know. Previously, we were using random hooks, and now we're actually using real objects and interfaces. Um, and again, this is spread throughout course. So plugins have been um, been taken on and re replaced a whole lot of inconsistent ways we were doing things um, all across Drupal 7. They're all now in a nice, consistent API. So the ob obvious place where this has improved is uh, that you'd be familiar with as a Drupal 7 developer is uh, registering a block. So you register a block in an info hook, and then when you need to uh, view that block, you only have one hook available in your module. Uh, so you need to have a switch statement, and then if you have five blocks, you have five ifs, elses, or switches, and so it's, it's a bit unwieldy. So now we have a nice, clean system. We can have uh, one, one plug-in uh, per thing. Yep. Yeah. So this is it. So basically, this is how a block would be done in Drupal 7, hook block info, block view, block configure, and those kinds of things. Um, so in Drupal 8, essentially all of a single block's um, yeah, code is all in one class, so it's nice and self-contained, um, and that basically um, means that it's just going to be easier to, to work with. Um, it supports, well, it's, it uses interfaces, so again, we've got good IDE support if you're using something like PHPStorm, something like that, you're going to be able to, to um, make sure that your class is calling the right um, functions. Um, and this is just a, a simple example, but this is how you'd write a block now in Drupal 8. So um, you might notice that we're using um, PHP annotations. So we've got a block annotation type. Um, we just need to provide an ID, an admin label, and a category for it. Um, and we're basically just extending block base. So the annotation just get discovered by Drupal. It knows that it's a block. It can put it into um, you know, the list of blocks that are available. Um, and then because we're um, uh, extending block base, we need to implement certain methods in order to, to work with that block. So block build, block save, block configure, all of those are defined in the interface. Block base gives us some nice helper methods in there to make it simpler so you don't have to write boilerplate code for everything. Um, and, and that's it. Yes? Uh, you will always need to write build. So block base might um, give you some helper methods and it might give you some support for things that are optional. Um, but you're always going to want to build a block because otherwise you wouldn't get anything back. So that would probably be one where it's in the interface but not in the base class. So the basic pattern is to satisfy the interface and then sometimes you'll have uh, default, sensible defaults in a base class that you can override but are optional. So I think uh, form validation was was one example. There's a validate form method um, uh, in the interface, but the base class provides just a, a always passing validation. So okay, so so again, the advantages of it: we've got base classes, we're working with objects, we've got inheritance, and we've got one um, file per plugin. So we're not having to kind of squeeze a whole bunch of logic into switch statements if you've got a, 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 single, um, a single module that's got multiple block types. Okay, so uh, as I said before, there's lots and lots of plugins. Um, plugins are being used for everything in, in Drupal 8, so things like image styles, widgets, formatters, um, views, heavily uses plugins. Um, 
field types, and essentially, um, you know, once you once you kind of understand plugins, you'll be able to apply that throughout anything that you're doing. Um, okay, so we're going to just briefly look at entities and fields. Um, that's a field with entity on it. <laughs> In case you didn't get it. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, there's been a whole, whole lot of clean-up in um, the Entity API and the Fields API, um, and there was a great session by Fargo, I think it was on Tuesday. Um, so I encourage you, to, if you're interested in looking deeper, go and have a look on YouTube and find that. Um, they have a great session on the, the API changes. Um, and basically in Drupal 7, custom entities were pretty painful and they were quite difficult to, to even though there was... Suddenly there was this uh, API that you could use. You could go and build your own entities. Um, there was still quite a lot of, of, of um, work you needed to do, and most people typically avoided them. Uh, they were basically half-finished was, was the problem, and, and um, you should definitely uh, check out Fargo, Fargo's uh, presentation. But uh, finishing the entity API was uh, a goal of Drupal 8 and it seems to have gone very well. Yeah, so entities are first-class objects now um, with interfaces. Um, instead of a bunch of, of hooks, um, and classes can be swapped. We've got a common and a consistent API around that now. Um, we've also got some new field types. So these ones are all in core now. Um, so link, email, comment. Oh, comment um, is still being worked on. Um, and things like um, entity reference. So, I mean, that's hugely powerful if you're doing, you know, uh, data modeling in Drupal be able to use that. That's all, that's all built in. We're actually using entity reference for a lot of things in Drupal core now. Um, and, and part of the mobile initiative was to add things like telephone support so that you can you know, have telephone fields. Um, how are we going for time? So basically, um, this, we've got a new, new concept, which is, um, you might have known that in Drupal, Seven, you've got things like display modes. Now you've actually got um, support for creating those directly in Drupal 8. And also additionally, you've got form modes. So you can actually have multiple forms for a single entity. So if you think of things like the registration form, you might want to have, when a user signs up, you want to only show a couple of fields, but then when they go and edit their profile, you can have a whole lot more. They're called form modes now, so it's a nice, clean way of doing that in Drupal 8. Um. The properties are, are treated consistently as fields now as well, so you can use widgets and formatters on them. Yep. Okay, so these are all plugins, so we're using those APIs, um, and we've got first class objects. So if anyone's familiar with the Drupal 7 way of doing it, um, now you can do it in the Drupal 8 way down the bottom, which is a hell of a lot cleaner. I never really, I always had to check what the actual syntax was when, when accessing that. Um, so it's a lot cleaner. The API has cleaned up quite a lot. So yeah, yeah. Um, so if uh, if you uh, don't use a multi-value, it'll give you the first one if it is a multi-value, or you can just use square brackets to access a particular one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just a few changes. We won't go too much into the front end stuff, but I think the significant changes are around that we've swapped out um, PHP templates for Twig. Um, there's been a couple of sessions on Twig, which you may have seen already. Um, but essentially, um, it's just a simple name change. If you've got your template file, you just rename it to with an html.twig at the end. Um, and I think one of the big benefits is that we can actually enforce like a clean design around it. So we're not actually calling PHP code from our template files anymore. Um, and it's a simpler, simpler syntax. Um, so this go see, go see Morton's session. Yeah. Is there a session? Uh, I think he did a lab. A lab. He's doing a lab, yeah. Um, so basically we've just got simple printing out variables. Um, we've got some um, if and if statements, which is basically, a, 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 you know, we've got some shortcuts, we've got loops, those kinds of things. We're not executing any PHP in there. Um, and one of the big things for, for module developers is that... Um, the theme function's actually been deprecated, or has been removed in Drupal 8. So if you were calling theme inside your module code in Drupal 7, essentially what you're doing is you're creating, you're turning it into a string, and then from then on, anything that kind of wants to access it afterwards, um, 
can't really modify the, the, the data structure. It's too late. It's already turned into a string. So um, what, what was agreed is that just encourage using render arrays as much as possible. Um, so now um, it's the only way you can do it. So instead of calling theme and then calling a theme um, function, you just return a render array and you can actually pass in what theme function you want to call. You can do this in Drupal 7 now. It's just enforced in Drupal 8. Um, another important thing is that Drupal add JS and, and Drupal add CSS are gone. Um, we actually have to declare the dependencies now with a, with, um, a libraries, the libraries API. So um, and that's again is in a YAML file. Um, so basically there's two steps. The first thing is you declare your dependencies and then the second step is on the, the page that you actually use it. So you use returning a form array or a render array, you use the attach function in your render array to specify what library to include. Um, and the main reason for that is basically performance improvement on the front end. So instead of loading jQuery on every single page load, um, you only load it now on the pages that actually need it. So there's been going to be a huge reduction in that. Um, and there's actually uh, work still going on to integrate with Ascetic, um, which is like a, a um, another way to try and try and optimize these files further. Um, so this is an example um, of in your module, you just create this libraries file, and all you're saying is that your module um, dep depends on jQuery or core Drupal. Um, so that that that's your library definition for your module, and then again when you're when you're returning a form array, you would just specify that you're going to attach your library and specify the name of your library, and that's it. So um, that will load your JavaScript and your CSS. Okay, so just a few final thoughts to wrap up. I think um, the main takeaways I, I want you to have if you're not familiar with, with Drupal 8 is that there's a lot of complexity now under the hood, so there's been a whole lot of code added. We've got external libraries. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of functionality going on under there now. Um, we've had changes to the routing, um, to how forms work. Um, we we're using plugins everywhere. We've got a whole new configuration API um, and re totally revamped entity and field APIs. Um, but I think, and Dries did mention this in his keynote the other day, um, we do, even though we've got simp, simp, uh, increased complexity under the hood, I think um, we've actually got a much more simplified developer experience. The, the API is going to be um, a lot easier to work with and because there's less kind of magic going on, uh, a lot more explicit declaration of what you actually need to do and consistency across, across everywhere. So, um, yeah. So I guess we've got, have we got any time for questions? If you have questions, just come up and use the mic so we can record you. I was on my way back, but it just this worked out perfectly. <laughs> uh, when when you were uh, demonstrating extending the controller base and the, the replacement to hook menu, there, there was a bit I didn't quite get. Um, and uh, one of your functions took as an argument. It it said. Connection and then database. What, what was that about? What, what, what was that accomplishing? That, that was to show how uh, dependency injection might work. So some, something rather than uh, calling out to a, a database function, um, you would actually in, in inject the dependency into the object that's going to make that call. And that lets you do things like, um, if I'm writing a test for that class, that, that, con that controller class, um, I can uh, have a dummy, a dummy object that gives me gives me uh, results that I that I want, um, and I can test that class in isolation um, without actually having a database. Uh, so that's that's one that, that was what that was meant to, to illustrate. Yeah. So connect, connection was the name of the class. Okay. But I mean, it's just the way that it's the way that it's named is called, it's it's the database connection. So it's a pretty common pattern in Drupal eight just to call that connection database instead of connection. So yes, yeah, so that was type hinting actually, which I think we didn't re really explain. So if you haven't seen OOP uh, PHP, um, you can actually uh, enforce a type of an object that you're accepting. So you can say so that the variable that we're accepting was called database, but the type was connection. So we're only going to accept connection or ch or children of connection objects. 
Okay, thank you. Hello. <coughs> um, I have two questions. The first one, the, with the menu router or the new, the new changes, what about wildcards? Are they working the same as Drupal 7? Um, they work slightly differently. So um, in, in Drupal 8, you can have placeholders. Um, so you can, you can do the same thing. It's got the same kinds of things there, although there was um, something that was uh, a little bit complicated, which is we don't have the automatic path extensions. You know, when you can, you can add extra parameters to the end of your URL and they get converted to arguments. So I uh, think for most of those situations, you would use a query string instead now. So you could still do things like node, slash and then put node ID or a node in as a, a parameter um, and you can use curly braces to find that that's a parameter but it, it would only take it only take arguments that have node and then a number right it's not going to take node a number and then slash something else else something else something else so that's just a limitation of what the symphony routing system supported and it actually created a whole bunch of complexity the way that we were doing it before and I think most of those Symphony documentation is good for that topic as well. Yeah. So you could look look that up there as well. Okay. Um, the second one is: um, Is there any change or any new things related to performance and cache, and I don't know different kind of aggregation, the auth cache? Uh, anything that was uh, thought differently to make it easier for things to be cached? Yeah, there was. There's been a lot of stuff added in terms of caching. So. I should say that at this stage in the Drupal 8 cycle, that's the kind of area that's being worked on still. So um, there's still performance optimizations going and they'll probably continue to go until the final release. Um, but there is a caching API um, in Drupal core um, and, and mostly, um, yeah, so basically that's an extensible system as well. So you can actually cache, you can call the Drupal cache or um, and you can replace the caching subsystems with different cache bins and those kinds of things. So um, you could kind of you could do the same sort of thing in Drupal Seven, but it's just a, it's object oriented now. It's in a cleaner way. It's a, it's a nicer way to do it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, with the movement away from the hook system in a lot of places and definitions in YAML files, uh, what happens to alter hooks? Alter hooks haven't gone away. They're still there. So that's still... Um, there was some talk about moving everything to Symphony events. I think that was probably just a bridge too far in terms of the changes. So um, we've still got hooks. We've still got um, alter hooks. They're still in there. I think it was the kinds of things that, that moved away from hooks were those kind of metadata-type hooks. So, like, you know, hook block info... Wasn't was just really providing some definition of, of a block, um, but there's still hooks are still widely used, and there's still a, a way that you can extend um, and and use hook alter to modify forms and those kinds of things. You mentioned that theme was deprecated, the theme function, uh, but in the render array you still have the theme parameter, and so. Uh, you're still defining theme underscore l item list or theme underscore whatever, right? That still is how you create a theme? Te yeah. Templates only. Templates only. So yeah. if my module wants to provide two or three different themes, I'm, I need to put the twi I need to... Uh, yeah, so you would still do it the way that you do in Drupal 7. So you've got your theme registry, right? So you define what your theme functions are. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is that you, and that they're called theme hooks, right? So you basically say, these are my theme, theme hooks that I've got, and you specify what template each theme hook uses and what variables it uses. That's, that's pretty much the same. The difference is that you used to be able to write a, a function right. to, to render that, that you know, as the theming function. You can't, you can't do that anymore. You need to have a template. So those template files then go in the module? Yeah, they go as part of your module. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean in public, uh, so this is coming from a good place. Um, your example for dependency injection, 
your database type hint should be, or your connection type hint should be an interface, right? Rather than, yeah, uh, or that's kind of that's your intention there. That's not actually yeah. a, a class. That's correct, an, that's correct, an correct, correct. I misspoke. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, so my real question is: Do you know uh, so all these base classes that are abstract? Um, kind of inheritance is a really, really rubbish model of composition in certain circumstances. Yes. Is there plans to sort of move to using traits rather than yeah, base we classes? actually we actually using traits for a lot of things now, and that's. That came fairly late. Um, only in the last six months have we started moving things over to using traits. So you might have seen the T function, um, the move to this T. So that moved over, uh, that's moved to traits now because a lot of the base classes are using that. So anything that's common, so anything that's in form base that is common is move, being moved over to traits. Yep. Good point. 